also have the sign language interpretation to activate language interpretation for yourself you need to press the globe like button on the lower bar of zoom and choose the channel that you need should you have any remarks suggestions or questions please write them on the chat and now i'm happy to pass the floor to dragona you're welcome Thank you very much, Olga. Uh, and good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of Disability Rights International. Uh, Disability Rights International is an uh, international disability rights organization based in the uh, United States and with regional offices in Mexico and London. Uh, the RIs is dedicated to human rights, protection of human rights, and full community inclusion of children and adults with disabilities. And we have worked in more than 3,000 countries uh, documenting human rights abuses uh, of uh, children and adults with disabilities in institutions and also supporting uh, local advocates in many countries that we've worked in. In Ukraine, uh, Disability Rights International uh, has been working since 2010. We have done uh, initial uh, human rights monitoring uh, and published report in 2014 uh, named uh, No Way Home. Um, and we also uh, worked uh, on capacity building of uh, disability and family advocates in Ukraine uh, working together with uh, women-led uh, organization, Your Dimension. Uh, now we have been involved uh, in uh, human rights monitoring and also supporting families of uh, children with disabilities since March uh, 2022. Uh, and uh, we are happy to uh, be collaborating with newly established disability-led uh, Disability Rights Ukraine, um, who uh, will be leading our efforts on human rights monitoring, but also primarily supporting uh, children and young people with disabilities and family members uh, in their efforts to keep their children at home, to stay, to live in the community and prevent future institutionalization. Uh, we are happy to feature uh, voices of uh, people with disabilities, of family members today. Uh, we believe that they are very important and have, re respecting the principle of nothing without about us, without us, we would really like to feature uh, the voices of those affected by everything we are talking about today. So with no further ado, uh, I would like to pass on to my colleagues, but first, please allow me to express my deepest gratitude to all the families who have participated in the survey, uh, the interviews, and also many thanks to my colleagues in Ukraine who have been working since the begin beginning of Russian invasion under the most challenging of circumstances. So big thank you for me and uh, I'd be happy to uh, also listen to presentations, but also uh, engage in the discussion later today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dragana. Now I'm passing the floor to Helena. Thank you very much, Dragana, for the introduction. I am very happy to see you all. Uh, good evening to everyone. Glory to Ukraine. I am uh, extremely happy to see all of the participants and I would like to welcome everyone who will be listening to the recording. It will be available upon request. Tonight we are going to talk about the topic which is not new and on everyone's tongues. Very often it is not uh, believed to be pertinent enough, but it is a large scale problem. It has been large scale before the Russian invasion and it is uh, large scale today. Our task today is to give voices uh, to the people and families 
I'm afraid we lost the speaker. Therefore, our meeting today and the report that Disability Rights International drafted reflects the experience of families raising children with disabilities. And we are literally forwarding their words. While I am waiting for the permission to share the screen of my presentation, I would like to say that in December and in November, and then additionally in January and in February this year, we ran the survey for 513 families who volunteered to answer our questions and also 24 in-depth interviews were conducted. In addition, we asked 14 families to answer the questions about the barriers they face, about the challenges they have to overcome and about our, their daily routines. And also they were happy to share the photos. These photos are partially represented in the report and also in my presentation. And I am trying to share the screen, but I cannot do this. Caitlin, can you help me? Our respondents uh, come from different regions of the country. On the one hand, we did not have the specific sample, and we were selecting the families for the questionnaires that were not only biological families, but uh, we did not specifically select that, but we do not have any foster families among the respondents uh, or any adopted families. And we lost the speaker again, I'm sorry. So 83% of all of the respondents, they stated to live where they used to live before the full-scale invasion. So most of these respondents do not have the status of either internally displaced persons or persons displaced out of the country. 96% of the respondents, I will share my screen in a second. Thank you, Caitlin. And now I have a chance to demonstrate to you the slides uh, that are showing the families we surveyed, mostly women answered our questions. And it's an important aspect to mention. Here, this map shows the provisional locations of the people who were answering the questions of the survey. 96% of them were women. We were asking the parents about their experience, starting from the moment when the child with a disability was born, how uh, they were growing up, the experience of kindergartens, rehabilitation, uh, various child care centers, and also the questions followed about the young people with disabilities and also about their vision for the future of their adolescent children with disabilities. We saw very many barriers that are visible and sometimes invisible. To start with, I would like to get back to some slides and say that what we found and our key findings from the survey are not new. They're not unexpected at all. However, it is very important to collect this information now into one picture and to take a comprehensive view because this is a multi-layered comprehensive question. It relates to all of us, not only to the parents who are raising children with disabilities. So what we saw from the responses from the parents because there were open questions and closed questions, uh, sometimes the there were questions that allowed comments without any limitations for the multiple choice uh, answers. Understanding that our social protection system is not child-centered uh, is one thing, but it's 
not family centered either. So when we start working in the social protection with a child or with a family, when the problem arises, before the problem becomes pertinent, the social protection system does not see that child or the family. According to the answers of the respondents, we could see that early intervention services were mostly inaccessible to most respondents. And we lost the speaker again. So when the child was born, mostly there was no this concept uh, for early intervention in the country, mostly because they were living in other cities or towns uh, than the cities where they started uh, introducing these early intervention services in 2017. This is the official date. So also, it was difficult for them to access uh, these uh, places uh, where the early intervention services were available. For example, public transportation was difficult to access. And uh, sometimes the uh, single mothers uh, could not manage um, to travel. And also in their open comments, the respondents were saying that if they were taking the services of early intervention, this is what helped them accept and embrace that the fact of the disability of their child is not the tragedy, it's not the disaster, and it empowered them to be the advocate for their child uh, to protect their rights for education, etc. Mostly those were the moms that uh, today have the children of the preschool age. So we can understand that many things have changed in Ukraine since the 1990s and the 2000s, and it is getting better even though at a slow pace. So what I need to say, not everything is that bad. We just need to continue our effort. As to the kindergarten access uh, experience, well, the access is available. According to the law, the kindergartens could start the inclusive groups, but this is at the will of the kindergartens and their directors. But even in the kindergartens with the inclusive groups, the experience of parents was that the personnel was either not motivated because they were professionally untrained or they were not motivated because they were emotionally unprepared. In any case, they were mentioning the inaccessibility of the kindergartens and also the resistance coming from the parents of children without disabilities. And here, we must reiterate that this is our role as a society for those parents who do not have children with disabilities. We should not think of them as the segregated category. We, the parents, those who are the parents, and the parents of children without disabilities could pose a barrier for the full inclusion of children with disabilities into the community, starting with the kindergarten. And those who had the positive kindergarten experience, they also had the positive feedback about schools. So they had the uh, possibility to integrate into schools, but it's a different story about the schools. We're not going deep into that. But those who haven't had the access to the kindergarten, mostly those were the parents of children with uh, the uh, autism uh, spectrum. They also further had challenges accessing the school education. For the education of children of the group A with the high needs of support, so they are considered untrainable uh, for our system, so there are no daycare center in uh, sufficient numbers, but there is a remark that we need to make because the daycare center is not education uh, establishment, but it is not available either, especially in the smaller settlements. And this is also something we would like to discuss today with the discussants. Therefore, children with their grave disabilities, they need to be taken care by parents only. And this literally means by mothers, because in Ukraine, mostly, uh, mothers uh, are the primary caregivers for children and children with the disabilities in particular, which means the mom is also 
um, imprisoned in the isolated home, the same as her child. All of that affects the parents. Parents are not able to self-actualize themselves professionally. They're not able to work. Well, of course, we are talking about the moms and our survey showed that among our respondents, 27% were single mothers. Here we can see a big share, a significant share of uh, single mothers raising children with disabilities. These are mostly uh, intellectual disabilities or the autism spectrum a diagnosis. This is what our survey showed out of these uh, 500 plus families. These young women mostly have a higher education degree. At the moment, they are part of the human capital. This topic about the recovery of Ukraine is mostly about the human capital capacity, and we are losing it as a country these days. And here we can see this interesting trend that most women were answering our questions. These are 30 to 45 years of age. They are young, they have higher education, they have the capacity to be economically active, but they cannot afford this. On the contrary, they are negatively contributing to the economy against their will. So we can see the link of all of these aspects to each um, one to another. And basically, they are fulfilling the role of the free caregivers. As to the barriers that the families uh, with children with disabilities uh, face, they could be visible or invisible. The visible barriers, for example, are shown in the photos. And these are the photos that the parents sent us uh, uh, in response to the question about the barriers they face. So you can see the ramp next to the hallway, but uh, that means accessibility. But again, when you enter the hallway, there is another staircase uh, to access the elevator. So on the outside, we might have the signs uh, of uh, accessibility, but the, on the inside, there are still issues. Another interesting illustration, these are two different cities. Take a look, this is Ternopil and this is Odessa. So we have these uh, uh, public buses and there are some barriers that we haven't noticed before we got a little kid and uh, the uh, children's trolley. And these are the quotes of the parents. So we can imagine how the problems grow with the children growing. So if a woman needs to take care of the child with a disability of group A, that means they will have to use the uh, push chair all the time. And uh, if it's a three year old child or 12 year old child, these are two different children. And it affects the women's health. And then later, uh, because of the isolation and these several hours of taking care of the child, it's 24 seven, she doesn't have time or doesn't have the possibility to take care of her health and to get to medical care. Uh, the fact uh, that uh, the rehabilitation or some early intervention or developmental uh, classes are available, the access to them has uh, reduced after the beginning of the war. And uh, obviously, there is the general decrease uh, uh, of the accessible uh, government funded classes. Also, the affordability of the private classes uh, reduced because uh, the prices went up, uh, people lost jobs, uh, and it is extremely difficult for parents with children with disabilities to afford it. Somebody raised their hand or something? No. We also have the invisible barriers and they are all the isolation. They make the isolation. When everything looks like accessible, but children with disabilities are isolated for different reasons, either because 
they are not able to travel to some socialization site or their parents have financial issues to pay for it all. And also there is no child-centered approach. There is no inclusion. And uh, many parents said that the society is not uh, accepting their children in different ways. Another question, uh, well, is related to the age of the children. Well, children with disabilities, they grow the same as other children, and they have the same needs as their peers. So the adolescents uh, who are turning into the young adults, they also have needs for career guidance, for um, other needs. Uh, and we can see this illustrated in these photos, uh, barrier-free uh, spaces. For example, the mom says that my child, who is 16 years of age now, a child with disability, can only go to the children's playground, which is absurd. And then after 16 year or 18 years of age, all of the services for children with disabilities, they disappear. They're not available anymore. And also there are no systems that help transition to the independent living on the community level. So since I have the child and when my child uh, comes of age, I could expect uh, that uh, the child would go and live the independent life while the parents of children with disabilities have higher anxiety levels about that because they can see only one solution when the parents uh, pass away. Uh, the only future for their child with disability will be the institution. And now I would like to illustrate this aspect this is the answer to the question about the barriers or challenges the parents face today. In this photo, you can see a child wrapped in the blanket and they are staying in the corridor during the air raid alert. Well, the challenges and barriers during the war, and I'm quoting, they are almost the same as in the peacetime. So we can see that it's not the war that caused problems for families of children with disabilities, it reinforced them and then could increase them. So this is also about the unwillingness for fulfilling their duties. For our family, the major obstacle and barrier was that there is no bomb shelter in our building. The closest bomb shelter is in the school, which is located 15 minutes walk away from us. And you need to pass through the courtyard and you need to take three staircases. The ramp is only at the entrance to the school and then eight stairs more. Then you go to the uh, courtyard and then you go down to the basement, which is not uh, feasible because this uh, child is using a wheelchair. Then I continue the quote, once we tried to stay in the corridor. It's physically and morally more uh, acceptable and easier. Another problem both during the war and during the peacetime is that there is no communication for children with disabilities, no possibility for socialization. To conclude, I would like to remind you again that Ukrainian sociology is trending. She wrote this uh, paper care as work and she was describing the work that the women do uh, taking care of their children out of their work hours and they also well basically they did not focus specifically on women who have children with disabilities but basically they face the same barriers but multiplied only several answers to the question about what you had to face as a mom of a child with a disability. We can see in this photo a young woman with a push chair in a building with no lift operating. So in order to take a child for a walk, she always needs to carry this push chair up and down. The most frequent responses mentioned uh, what the barriers uh, are for the women. So mostly this is uh, the obstetricians uh, violence uh, during the delivery of the baby. And we lost the speak again. Uh, 
And uh, they also say you have a child with disability, you need to give this child away to the uh, institution because the child is traumatizing your other kids. Uh, also, they face the issues with the difficult psychological mental state, the society that is not ready to accept uh, children with disability next to their other children, also uh, relationship issues, also lasting um, therapy if uh, you can afford it, helplessness feelings, health issues, uh, constant uh, filtration of all of these uh, pseudo methodologies, techniques and rehabilitations. In Ukraine, parents always have to struggle to be searching for the services where they are available, what kind of services. There is no systemic information. And uh, also they face the barrier that it is not possible for them to save their child without the extra help during the uh, emergency situations, for example, during the war. Uh, for example, when they don't have a car in the family, for uh, one family shared that they had to live for several weeks in the uh, basement uh, as a bomb shelter of the hospital nearby of the house. You could see uh, that uh, respondents were coming from very different places, from Zaporizhia, from Kiev, from Kharkiv. Many places were bombed uh, all the time without access to bomb shelters, but uh, their parents decided not to evacuate because they did not have the resources to evacuate or relocate to safer places. Instead of recommendations, I would like to pass the floor on to our other discussants. As to recommendations, I believe we could talk uh, about them together in the end. Thank you, Helena. I suggest we now pass the floor to Anastasia. Thank you, we're passing the floor to you. Hello, my name is Nastya Stepula. I had the chance to read the survey before this presentation and uh, I was despaired to see that every section relates to me. I have experienced it uh, to different degrees. As a Ukrainian person, as a Ukrainian woman who has a child with the disability, my son has autism quite deep and he was diagnosed in Ukraine uh, at the age of two. And all of the stages of the education of rehabilitation, we were taking them in Ukraine. And when uh, we received the diagnosis, I received the prescription for neuroleptics that my son totally did not need. I have not received any roadmap, no recommendations no explanations for the condition of my son and i had to explore and research into that by myself fortunately i spoke foreign languages i could use the internet and i could access the sources the literature uh, from international community. So I received the information which was extremely different from the information I received in Ukraine. Why? Because everything that I accessed in Ukraine was the information that autism is the horrible condition. So my son at the age of 15 will be masturbating in the middle of the store and I would not be able to do anything about that. Um, so I will just have to bury my life with this diagnosis or maybe give him away for the institution and maybe uh, have another healthy child. I was reading a lot from the international sources and I came to realize that situation and reality is different and there are many things I could work with. And also I need to say that we were lucky about many aspects. We lived in the capital city, in the big city, we had access to therapy. We didn't have to travel hundreds of kilometers to get access to therapy. And also we were financially uh, capable. Uh, our experience was uh, starting with the kindergarten. Well, at that uh, 
time we were attending the kindergarten with this know-how diagnosis uh, unique for Ukraine, autistic features. And this diagnosis, um, this is uh, allegedly not the diagnosis of autism, but uh, just uh, something adjacent. Uh, so it took us a year to wander around and I realized that I had to start private therapy. Fortunately, we had money to cover that. The financial aspect is critical here because that therapy was 80% worth of my budget back then. So these were high costs and uh, from the private kindergarten, private uh, sessions, private school, this was our trajectory. And I always had this condition of constant fear and stress uh, for losing the financial income and work and the possibility to pay for it all because I realized this is when my life was going to stop and the development of my child. Also, there is another critical conclusion I reached uh, back then when we still lived in Ukraine. This is my conclusion about the mindset and the perception of disability in the society. I thought uh, that uh, this, this did not relate to me because uh, of my situation and also I had the knowledge, but I now realize that I also was in that uh, condition because of the strong stigma and the attitude of society to people with disabilities. This is like the, um, you know, God's punishment, karma, repayment, you are bad, disability is bad, you are guilty, you are to blame, you're guilty before the society, before the world, before your child, because you gave birth to the child that the society doesn't like, that the society doesn't find convenient. And I believe that many parents of children with disabilities, they do not insist uh, and demand for the services from the state. No, I don't mean they don't demand, they do. don't do it loud enough and persistently enough. They don't think that the society and uh, the state uh, owe to them, that they have to help them. They believe that they are themselves to blame. So they have to figure this out by themselves. Because of this mindset and because of this perception, Parents also have the stigma towards their children. And I realized, well, back then I thought uh, it was not my case, but now I live in Switzerland and uh, it's only now when I feel that I got rid of that feeling of guilt, that I am deficient and my family is deficient and my son is deficient uh, before the society. And I used to have it, uh, this feeling. As to the second conclusion, I could say that all of these stages, despite the fact that we were taking therapy and my objective was that we were going to live the life the same as everyone else, we still were extremely isolated. Also because of the perception, because if you have autism, disability or any other condition that goes uh, beyond norm, it's a shame. So many parents who have such children, especially about autism, they uh, think it proper to hide the diagnosis of their children or to hide their children. And today I know about many situations. I recently faced this story, this thought, there are so many children with autism over here. This diagnosis is so widespread. But then I paused and I realized it's not about the number of people with autism in Switzerland. It's because people are ready to openly speak about this. I'm sorry, Anastasia, to interrupt you, but uh, we are pressed for time. So if you can, I uh, would like to ask you to come to an end. So there is no isolation. And uh, also I went to share that when my son was uh, finishing the, the school uh, here, when I'm staying, 
And uh, I was so surprised to hear that we are only saying good things about the child. And I asked, uh, what are the bad things about my son? And they said that they do not have any bad things to say about my son. This is the critical difference between Ukraine. And I could say that the right for life and the possibility for parents to have the full-fledged life, uh, it empowers you a lot and gives a lot of opportunities for the state. Today, I am in the situation when I am uh, 35 years old and I'm supposed to be 30 years more the taxpayer in Ukraine. But I also understand that if I return to Ukraine to die, then my child will only have one year of living in his private school and then we will have to stay at home. That is why I face an extremely difficult choice uh, uh, to make. Um, so I probably uh, have to think not about the temporary immigration or uh, being a refugee and maybe shifting my taxes to the country where my son will have many more years of high quality life. Thank you. I'm sorry uh, for interrupting you, but I would like to pass the floor to the next panelist. And this is Olena. Koval. Good evening. I'm raising a child with a disability. My son, Volodya, he's eight. He is going to be nine. He has the orphan disease. And I usually like saying my son won the jackpot because he has the grave intellectual and functional disability. And when Volodya was born, well, no one was prepared for that because we did not know our son would have a disability. But eventually, when we learned about the diagnosis, it is a rare disease, we started reading around. So what we faced is that there is a huge lack of information and I am certain because I talked to many families raising children with disabilities that if a family gets a child with a rare or faint disease, the first thing the families face is lack of information. However, the fact that we have internet now and we can find all of the descriptions, well, sometimes we know more than the doctors we see for advice because they are usually treating the consequences uh, but they do not know about the course of the disease currently on the territory of ukraine and i'm exploring that issue in detail and i also am a public activist in my city in the city of ternopil i'm the head of the ngo before the war the statistics was that we had about 164,000 children with disabilities Recently, I also made the request that we have about 300,000 children with disabilities and uh, about half of them is the group A. This means that they require the full-time support and care. So if we talk about this category of children, because these children with the degree four and five of functional uh, disruptions and disabilities, I know from my experience, they are excluded from society. Before the war, we had some possibilities to take some classes, but they were disastrously few. Now, during the war, there are even fewer of them. Any air raid alert makes you, you know, for security reasons to disrupt the education process and you have to go to the bomb shelter. What I mean is that we lack socialization. We lack the regular systemic training, not just once in a week, uh, several hours or two times a week. Uh, it's a drop in the sea. And uh, the children like my son, Volodya, they are totally isolated. Uh, because, well, the parents and me as a mother, we are also isolated. But it's also crucial to understand that when you talk about the support to these families, 
you should think about the development of social services uh, on the grounds. So we also want to promote to our local governments to advocate to them that we lack uh, the basic social services. For example, the daycare groups uh, that could be a bridge of support for families who raise children with the uh, grave uh, conditions with disability to offer the possibility for these children to lead more or less normal way of life because they might have other children so you cannot pay attention to two children at a time i usually like to make jokes uh, it would be good to have a clone to you know be able to tear apart and to stay with uh, both children at the same time recently we had a meeting and we were told uh, just go ahead if you need the services if you need the changes go ahead and do it i understand this is the way we need to uh, move this uh, rock but if you only have 24 7 and your hands tied you don't have the team you don't have the capacity well most uh, parents they are tied to their children not all of them have relevant education etc so we need to have the algorithm in place for all parents and we must say that we need the support of the government to be able to advocate and promote those services at least basic services on the grounds why do we need them we need them on the community level because Helena mentioned the burnout in the beginning because these parents need to be able to last as long as they can to take care of their children. Thank you. I'm sorry, Elena, for interrupting. We have about uh, five minutes for each panelist. I'm passing the floor to Nadia. Thank you, dear friends, for this possibility to speak and to share the experience of our organization. When I was uh, reading the findings of the survey, I was happy to see that the survey and the research covered children with disabilities, but also it uh, mentioned the recommendations such as the introduction of the assisted living, also offering the services for young adults. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. And this, well, I read this survey and it said, uh, one of the quotes, that most uh, children with disabilities with the due care and support could live in families. And we could say the same about the young adults, because with the due support and care, most young adults could be able to live independently rather than in the institution or with their parents. They could live as the uh, normal, typical people reaching certain age, they become independent and live um separately we can all understand that assisted living is the alternative to institutions it's a pity that over the time of the war we can see the statistics the data says that from two to four thousand uh, people uh, with disabilities they got to the institutions uh, of social protection system because well, it's good that we have this simplified system now to get to the institution, but we also need to understand uh, that if uh, the system of um, services uh, of assisted living was developed, uh, then uh, for, for people with disabilities, we wouldn't have these numbers. Presently, we are talking about our expectations. We would like to see a different situation after the war so that the government and society 
could have a different a change the attitude to issues of people with disabilities in particular we would like to advocate also for the government uh, that the assisted living format could not be managed by the ngos alone and also it's a long-term project now on june 1st we signed the agreement with the project mh for you and now our organization will be introducing the assisted living our organization is called uh, the family for persons with disabilities we are located in kiev but we are incorporating this service not in kiev but in festive town near kiev because in kiev the government is very difficult to approach uh, so we failed uh, to find uh, the premises the facilities the government was not open enough uh, to help us and to assist us the government do not have this understanding now that this service is critical and timely so we are trying to reiterate that the non-governmental organizations alone would not be able to incorporate this uh, service uh, for long term or for the permanent basis we also realize that the government would not manage on their own as well they do not have the resources needed and now after the war they will not have the relevant resources because they will have to reallocate a lot of money for the recovery and rebuilding of the country there are more important things to take care of that is why we need uh, to speak this out and we need to, to promote the symbiosis of effort to introduce this service of assisted living so we believe uh, the government uh, could uh, take care of the methodology some administrative aspects local authorities who could allocate the uh, facilities the premises the funding and the ngos as the service providers who would uh, offer the personnel maybe some current costs could be covered uh, uh, the client selected etc also i need to say that we are facing such challenges as uh, well this it's not only that society is not prepared but also the young adults are not ready because if they live in the family they are not prepared for the independent living because nobody considers this alternative there is this hyper uh, care from the parents and also if a young adult stays in the institution they are also not prepared for the independent living there is no option also the parents are not prepared they are psychologically not prepared to let their child to go or they have this bias they don't understand this assisted living or independent living they think it's uh, like a, a care or temporary uh, break for the parents but i think we will manage and we will do it and we will be able to introduce this service of course uh, there is no other way out we must uh, deliver and we must uh, uh, bring it to the uh, uh, successful implementation and we will be sharing that experience thank you for supporting this idea and thank you for giving us the platform to speak out thank you nadia and now i would like to pass the floor to roslava does roslava yes i'm here are you driving everything's fine it's okay so have a safe drive and uh, tell us something you have five minutes i'll be fast i think if there are some questions i will be ready to discuss uh, today we have already heard some parents sharing 
I wanted to say something as a mom, but also I need to mention that over the past 10 years, many things have changed. That's true in Ukraine. I mean, in the context of how society perceives it, of course, I wish we could have more changes, but the changes have taken place. I'll be frank, this is what I see and experience. Also, my second role is that I am representative of the social services prov provider in the city of Lviv. Not only social services, but the bonus is that my son and I will live in Lviv. And this was this center was developed here. And now I am developing these services also for the community. So when we talk about the services for children with disabilities, for adults with disabilities, for the families raising them, or uh, where the young adults live. So we need to talk about the integrated services and uh, the interaction of different areas, social and medical sphere. Unfortunately, we still have major issues in that. Sometimes uh, uh, it looks like uh, the social sphere and uh, medical sphere and others, they are like the parallel worlds uh, and uh, Basically, we need the proper management uh, to act in the interests of the child. So this is what we need to improve. It's also critical to build the efficient system of social services on community level, because social services, this is certainly the responsibility of the communities according to Ukrainian law. At the same time, this is a lot of uh, spending and a lot of costs so the communities will not manage by themselves but at the same time they are obliged uh, to introduce and to develop the basic social uh, services like daycare like assisted living like the uh, uh, supervision during the inclusive education so our legislation is not bad it's good actually but the enforcement and the implementation they leave much to be desired. It is clear that building the efficient uh, social services system on the grounds is a difficult challenge. But in order to build it, we need to do the assessment and understand the needs of the communities. Unfortunately, no needs assessment for services is done in the communities, even though they are obliged to do this once in three years, but it's something formal. They don't do this. They only describe what is done. They don't take into account what the actual needs are, unfortunately. But at the same time, the parents, the NGOs, they must remind about this all the time, exercising their right to have this needs assessment. And on the basis of this needs assessment, it could be possible to develop and build the social services programs further to be able to get the funding allocated from the community budget. In the context of the center that I represent, they have uh, many years and decades of experience of uh, uh, providing services. We have early intervention, starting from early intervention to the young adults, daycare. Well, to be frank, uh, I do not really support that one center has so many services concentrated. This should be the open and uh, competitive market. We have the NGOs, we have municipal institutions, and they should strive for the best quality possible uh, for the clients uh, that require these uh, services. And the recent uh, service that we introduced uh, already during the war, this is uh, the support for inclusive education. Uh, these are the assisting teachers for the child. Uh, so these are for more grave cases with the uh, complex uh, disabilities, children. And this is uh, the case uh, that is uh, trying to contribute to the implementation of inclusion, mostly schools are not prepared. Uh, and uh, usually they have the assisting teachers and we need the uh, assistance for children. Thank you, Zoroslava. 
Anastasia, if you could move further from the screen so we could um, see your hands better for the sign language interpreter. Now I need to give the floor to Mikola. She has uh, he has little time time left because he had to to catch the train. Uh, well, I am on the train. It's uh, departing soon, but still I can talk. Um, could you share your story uh, with the experience of the institution? I know that you now live in a family or with a family. Tell us more. Well, well, I have uh, shared many times already that I grew up in the institution because my parents, uh, they gave me away in their childhood. Well, uh, they were afraid they wouldn't be able to care of, for me. And until the age of 20, I have lived in the institution. But uh, fortunately, my life changed and the family adopted me in such an adult age because uh, unfortunately, it's a very little share of the adoption of adults. I could say uh, that I have lived in the family for seven years now. Many things have changed. I've learned many things because when I lived in the institution, I couldn't learn anything. How long have you lived outside the institution? Almost seven years. I haven't lived in the institution for seven years now. I was 23 when the, my parents um, adopted me. In your opinion, what shall we do now so that young adults with disability could live in the community? I need. I think we need the support from the um, state on the grounds in the commu on the community level. For example, the municipality for the place where you live. Because I can see now that they they actually pay like uh, some uh, social benefits. Uh, for children uh, in the foster families uh, uh, that they need to take care of, uh, but this is uh, a very little amount. Uh, so I wish they could help more. So the government doesn't need to allocate millions of funding for the institutions. They would rather shift this focus of help to the families. This is a very important conclusion. Helena, would you like to add something? Hi, hello. Well, I'm happy to see you. I'm happy that you managed to join us. I have a question. You are talking about the institutions that millions of funding are allocated for institutions. Please tell us more. The person who stayed in the institution for 23 years, please remind to us all, what kind of experience do you get there? All of us here in Ukraine are paying the taxes, and some of these taxes were used for the maintenance of institutions, like for the provision of specialized services. Have you received any services there? Well, tell me more. You know what I mean. Just tell me about your experience in the institution. Well, I lived there. It was like survival, rather. It was not life. I haven't received a penny from the government. I couldn't buy anything for myself, some sweets or some stuff. Or for example, when I had my birthday or buy something, nobody taught me how to take a walk along the streets, how to fight back, uh, speak back. What about education? What about the opportunities? Because we can't see here on the Zoom, but uh, uh, Makola is using a wheelchair. He's uh, quite an apt wheelchair user, but how convenient was it for you in the institution in that regard? Well, it was hard. When I was seven, we were not, they were not given um, the wheelchairs and I was crawling. So my legs were always dirty and um, I hurt. And then they gave me the wheelchair and I could move around better. 
I already shared at other places. I stayed inside for almost 10 years. I could not go outside. There was no ramp. So I couldn't go out. So we all heard it, right? It's very important to emphasize. There was no inclusion in the institution. Makola survived and got out of there against all odds, uh, rather than owing to the support of the government. There was no support at all. And this is something that our taxes are used for. Makola is now living in a family and he could live in the family before if his family uh, could receive the support in due time, the psychological, the financial support. I'm sorry, Makola, that I'm interfering, but I understand that we could lose the connection with you at any time because you're on the train, but we need to hear your voice. I need to say that thanks to volunteers, to friends, to local television, they helped me more than anyone else. I also had the court where I had to prove my legal capacity because in the institution where I lived, they always gave the diagnosis uh, for intellectual, uh, for mental retardation. This is how it sounds. And you cannot vote, you cannot uh, make decisions. So uh, legal capacity is denied to you. Did you have education there? Unfortunately, the institution where I stayed did not offer education. Only primary school, fourth grade. So we are now talking about the Nijin uh, childcare institution under the auspices of the Ministry of Social Policy. And it was considered that the children staying there or people staying there were not uh, trainable. And we can see Makola here over the seven years that you have lived in the family. Yes, it's been seven years. He managed to, but my life changed, crucially changed because I got to the family. Uh, we went around, we traveled to other countries. I was even flying a plane. We went to the wedding parties. And now you are traveling on the train by yourself, right? And uh, joining Zoom and right right it's just the regular life of a person so now when i was getting on the train they were asking me do you have anyone to accompany you and i answered no i'm independent i don't need to any accompaniment yes of course uh, i need help um, to get on the train because we have no inclusion i cannot uh, get on the train myself because we don't have uh, the low platform train uh, carriages exactly but otherwise i'm independent so i came from my village where i live myself to the train station we are very happy to see and uh, listen to you today now we have little time for that but your words are very important and your case and your example is crucial to see because very often we tend to underestimate the capacity and potential of children who we give away to the institution, both the parents and um, the state. So now I have the mission for myself to help others who now live in the institution. So, I mean, the little kids, anyone, the, the infants, when they give them away to the orphanages, uh, I'm trying to help um, for finding families, uh, for the parents who want to adopt, uh, or the parents who raise children with disabilities or have uh, children with disabilities uh, where they were born, could they get support, maybe jobs, other opportunities? Because an institution life is not life. Thank you. It's very important not to have the Ukrainian people in the institutions. And what is very important to say is to support the young people so that they could get jobs, live their lives uh, and uh, travel when they want, for example, like Kole is doing now. So the disability is not a barrier. Thank you. And they could uh, bring their dreams to life. Thank you, Mikola. Have a safe trip. And thank you for inviting 
Unfortunately, I cannot speak longer. It's just a coincidence that I have to travel, so have a safe trip. Thank you. Thank you, Mikola. And now I am passing the floor to Irena Fedorovich. Hello, I'm here. I'm not even sure what to start with or what to talk about. Well, first of all, Mikola, thank you for your story. Now on the chat, I will share the link to our recent report. My colleagues and uh, I, we were doing the monitoring for the institutions with the adults uh, who have not been educated in the childhood, who do not, uh, cannot get jobs and cannot live independent lives. Uh, and in our opinion, in opinion of our organization, the government doesn't remember about them. They forgot about them. So we work in the human rights organization and uh, we uh, cared for the uh, rights uh, of children with disabilities. But uh, after the full scale invasion, we started getting the calls uh, of the family members of the people who live in the institutions asking whether anyone was evacuating them. And this is when we started traveling to the grounds, to the sites, to the institutions trying to understand what is happening there. Is anyone helping the adult people living in the institutions? We could see what was happening in the first months uh, of uh, the war. They were evacuating some institutions, some orphanages, the children, but uh, nobody cared about the adults. Uh, so we started with the desk start, desktop study, and then we went to the grounds uh, to uh, check and monitor uh, the conditions, living conditions of the adult people with disabilities living in the institutions, whether anyone was evacuating them. The situation is critical. The government says that at least 44,000 of adult people with disabilities uh, live permanently in the institutions, in addition to other people who, because of the war and forced relocation, are forcefully institutionalized who got to the institutions now in the adult age because they are not able to receive social services outside the institution. In 2014, when the war only started, uh, the war of Russia against Ukraine, we were saying that uh, the government's uh, incapacity to manage the large scale relocation of people uh, trying to take care of the social services for people with disabilities. Therefore, some adult people, old age people, uh, they end up in the institutions because they didn't have anywhere to live. And the problem hasn't been addressed since then. We do not know the exact and precise numbers of the new people who got into the institutions, at least now for the permanent residents. Uh, because we have another problem in the country, among other things, our government, our country is not able to count people. They do not know where people are or how many of them. And the other speakers also mentioned that but we lack the needs assessment in the communities, uh, the Ministry of Social Policy, the Ministry of Health Care and other ministries uh, should be doing that. Uh, what we have noticed over the past 18 months, uh, trying to get some numbers to understand uh, for our work, uh, the subject for the discussion, and to be able to plan further, we realize that every time we are getting different numbers and they do not match, they never matched. Uh, and this is a huge issue because uh, Ukrainian NGOs and international NGOs uh, because Ukraine is also the country that is receiving and uh, requesting the international technical assistance. They are not able to be precise enough uh, to explain who the target audiences are. In 2017, the reform started uh, uh, for the institutional system, but the bridge between the institutions for children and for adults uh, failed to have been built. For parents now, the major issue is uh, about the future for parents who are not sure what would happen if we are not able to take care of our children anymore, what would happen to them. Currently, the government offers that uh, these uh, uh, children end up in the institution, but there is no education, there is no development, there is no support, there is nothing like normal life in the institution, not even close. This is what Mikola was saying. The institutions, they're not accessible, there are no education, there is no job opportunities, so people are caged in. Getting back to, well, currently, 
we do not have the vision in the country for the institutionalization of the adults, but the demand is huge. The previous speakers also mentioned the huge load and huge burden for the state. But I need to say that the government doesn't like the numbers. Recently, we attended the public event and there was the representative of the Ministry of Social Policy and they said that uh, the maintenance or the cost rather of the government uh, for one adult person in the institution is about 12,000 hryvnias a month. I think if we transfer this amount to the services on the community level and also expanding the assisted living system, then the situation might be much better. Another number that we had from the Ministry of Social Policy, and we can see this when we analyze the information from different communities, that the cost for social sphere in our communities are very different. We have mentioned today about the social protection law. It's actually very good on paper, but very bad in practice, even before the full-scale invasion. But now we can see the transition in the context of decentralization, transition to the community level uh, coverage of social costs uh, also creates inequality because there are communities with the larger budgets uh, and more active citizens uh, and more advanced uh, local uh, managers who are introducing social services, at least some of these mandatory 18 services. But on the other hand, there are communities who are trying to save on their budget on the social services. Therefore, when we talk about the parents, the child or the adult with a disability, uh, it, is, it depends where, in which community they live. And therefore, it pushes towards institutionalization. The second important conclusion was analyzed in the context of the uh, uh institutional reform for children unfortunately they had to uh, deliver social services uh, they were declaring they were doing this on the community-based level because the institution was located in their community but basically they were offering the services in the institution in the remotely located communities uh, where the lower income levels uh, uh, this situation could push uh, to parents to institutionalize their child at least uh, for several days a week uh, in order to avoid uh, commuting every day. So this is the question of the balance and the reform of that system of social services. And I believe for Ukraine, it is extremely pertinent today. And this is something that we should discuss not only on the national level, but also on the level of international partners cooperation. And also, I need to say in conclusion that in the context of recovery, uh, as part of this narrative that Ukraine promotes on the international level, trying to get support for the recovery and the rebuilding, and also in the context of our EU aspirations, Ukraine must uh, start changing the system uh, of social support uh, and promote the institutionalization and to receive the support from the EU in that regard, because the standards have changed in the EU. But the question is whether Ukraine is ready to admit that they are ready to commit to that. And I am asking the colleagues who are representing the NGOs to promote that topic because we cannot afford uh, to build uh, back uh, the inaccessible and non-inclusive Ukraine we have had before the full-scale invasion. Today, we have a chance uh, to change our country for the better. Thank you, Irena, for important words and remarks. We should um, push forward into that direction. And in conclusion, I would like to pass uh, the floor to uh, the member of the Commission for the Investigation of the War Crimes in Ukraine, Daniela. Can you hear us? Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> How are you? So uh, I'm in Kyiv. Sorry for 
my setting, but I try to move to a place a bit quiet. So basically, uh, just to explain, I work as child rights specialist for the Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine. Shall I continue or wait for translation? Okay, so I work for the International Independent Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine that was established by the United Nations Human Rights Council last year in March to investigate all human rights violations in Ukraine during the armed conflict. So as child rights specialist, I'm looking at the transfers of children to the Russian Federation and to occupied territories. Uh, we're investigating it and we report to the United Nations in October and in March next year. Uh, we already submitted a report that I will share with you. And the reason why I was invited was to say that I'm looking also at children with disabilities from institutions, from hospitals who have been transferred. And if any of your, you uh, individuals or organizations um, have any information on, on cases or situations of transfers or deportations of children, that uh, Halina has my contact. You can contact me uh, if you wish. Uh, all our information is confidential. We have a confidential database. We follow the United Nations rules of confidentiality and no information is published without the consent of the informants, of the victims, witnesses, or the sources. We don't put names in our report. Um, this is what I wanted to communicate. I don't know if anyone has any question. Thank you very much, Daniela. Should you have any questions for Daniela or for other panelists? It's the time to ask them. You can write your questions on the chat. I will uh, share, I, I have shared the report, but I will share again with Halina. She can share it with all the participants. There is one section on child transfers, but there's also other sections uh, on other violations and impact of the conflict. And uh, I, my, my contact telephone and contact email will be shared by Halina so that if any of you wants to share your uh, information, please feel free and you can ask me questions about confidentiality and how the information will be used. Thank you very much, Daniela. I can also see the question for Olga. Uh, from Olga, uh, we will share the contact. Uh, we have the question on the chat from Eric Rosenthal. About what our speakers think. Um, So Eric Rosenthal, the Executive Director of Disability Rights International, is asking us about what uh, we think about the international response to date, uh, whether we have seen any impact of international donors on the situation in Ukraine, and I can see Rena Fedorovich raised her hand. Uh, do you want to answer this question? I could start briefly. Maybe other colleagues would join. As an organization dealing with the advocacy, and over the past several months, we eventually started the systemic conversation with the UN agencies about how they are ready, uh, finally, to start implementing their approach in practice in Ukraine. And when the agencies eventually admitted that uh, not everything is not so good uh, in these organizations with the disability mainstreaming, but they are ready to pay more attention to promoting the rights of people with disability in the context of humanitarian aid in Ukraine and to demand more from their subcontractors 
and to support advocacy effort of Ukrainian organizations. So I could say that we finally made a shift, uh, but uh, it only happened one year after the full scale invasion. So we have this 50-50 impression. International community is uh, uh, talking a lot about the inclusion in the context of humanitarian response, but in practice, we see very few uh, efforts. Uh, and we can see here similar answers from our partners, from the smaller local organizations. They always say that in the context of humanitarian support and assistance like food supply, other stuff, they pay very little attention that this humanitarian aid must be accessible like uh, shared uh, on an equal basis for every person with a disability or the family raising a child or adult with disability could get access to this humanitarian aid. And also this humanitarian aid must be inclusive. We need to understand that there is a huge population with disability and they need to be accounted for in the context of humanitarian aid. Uh, we had this interesting case uh, to offer our explanation, for example, for the FAO, uh, that you do not need to hand out one kilo of rice because rice is not a popular, is not a stale, stale meal. And uh, we need to take into account that uh, we have a different food basket and we have different age of uh, children and adults with disabilities. And if you count your recipients and understand who you provide the humanitarian aid to, it will be easy for you to understand how to make it more efficient. Thank you, Rena. I will also ask about the engagement of the international donors. What do you think? In terms of recovering the infrastructure of the institutions, rebuilding it. If I may, I would like to say that for that first question, like, what do we think of the international response to date? I could say that in our NGO, currently, we are not receiving any funding from the Ukrainian government. Even before the war, the share of the government support was 10% for our organization. That is why whatever we have now, we offer the daycare for children. We offer social adaptation services for adults with disabilities, and we offer psychological support to parents. And we also received humanitarian aid. All of that was coming from the international donors. And of course, we would like to see this help coming from international donors to focus the community-based services rather than institutions. There is no alternative to the institutional services. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, Irena, uh, are you still raising the hand? This is the new hand, yes. I could tell you more about the institutions. I think the international donors uh, are, you know, in a split because we have this recommendation from the recent year from the UN Committee for People with Disabilities about the institutions, about how institutional care does not mean the uh, idea of the convention. And uh, they're also mentioning the institutions during the international conflicts, war conflicts, uh, military conflicts, and they are talking about the reconstruction of the institutions. But also there is the request from the Ukrainian government to the international partners about the reconstruction of the institutions. We can check the rapid uh, assessment uh, that is available for the damage uh, during the first year of invasion and the Ukrainian government jointly with the UN, the World Bank and the EU uh, made, and they are requesting 127 million for the reconstruction of the institutions. This is a huge amount. And here, I think this is the task for the 
uh, Ukrainian public activists, when we need to take the proactive position in the conversation uh, with donors, we need to share our vision for the recovery. In some situations, you need to repair the roof so that people have to uh, where to live. But then, on the other hand, we need to understand that Ukraine needs to commit how to develop the system further, but in parallel, providing the water supply or food supply or roofing in the available institution, that's one thing, but we need to develop the new system of social services. This is what I mean by the split. We are sitting in the split uh, because, of course, uh, the people do, that have stayed in these institutions for many years, they need something to eat uh, and they need that support now. But on the other hand, we need to be searching for solutions to these situations rather than supporting this horrible institutional system. Sorry, it's a difficult choice to make, but we must uh, raise this voice and we must speak this out. Well, that's true, because uh, the same situation is about the institutions for children. On the one hand, they say that children need families, but on the other hand, they are saying, how can you promote uh, that we don't need the support to institutions? There are children in there. How can you leave them? Yes, that's a split, uh, but... Uh, we need to develop the new social contract uh, and we need to understand uh, what is okay and what is not okay and that uh, this is not happening at the same time this is not happening overnight uh, and we still need to take this time and we have the plan we need to have the plan and we need to follow it i think that uh, we are already extending the planned time of the event but we have some questions from the attendees of our webinar, those who are listening to us. Please ask your questions either by raising your hand or writing the questions on the chat. I suggest we take another 15 minutes. Victoria, I can see you have your hand raised. Can you speak? Unmute. Hello, I can't see myself, but it was interesting to listen to all of the speakers. I am a mom of a child with the complex uh, disability and I relate uh, to each speaker. Currently, we live uh, out of the country in another country. And one of the reasons that we cannot come back I do not have the possibility to save the life of my child in Ukraine. After a year of the full-scale invasion, nothing has been done for children with disabilities to be able to live in their country and to have the possibility to get to the bomb shelter, to have the medical care, to have the medications that our children need. And we have been buying these medications uh, for years from abroad because they haven't been certified in Ukraine yet. There are very many issues that we faced before the war and they haven't been addressed yet. But it's great, on the other hand, that there are many more NGOs advocating for the rights of people with disabilities. They are developing the trainings. They are engaging mothers, parents of children with disabilities. They are engaging people with disabilities into this advocacy effort to really share our needs uh, to the government uh, and to the society. There is this great uh, project uh, supported by uh, the First Lady about the barrier-free society, about the inclusion. But my question is, is there at least one person on the team uh, with a disability? I know that they are engaging the NGOs, but I actually checked their you know, atlas of uh, free barrier-free. They um, produce the great educational uh, film. But me, as a mom of a child with disability, I experienced with my own skin all of the barriers that we have in Ukrainian society. And I have not seen that this project is really all encompassing and covering all types of nosology, of all disabilities. It's not comprehensive. It's not universal. They are labeling as a universal design, but it doesn't work. So my question is, well, I'm still learning. Also in different organizations like Fight for Right, 
I was shortlisted uh, after the training among other 16 team members who joined the team of democratic uh, development of barrier free society in Ukraine. And we would like to use our case and model to deliver this information on the community level to the mayors about the actual needs of people with disabilities. But currently, they're all about recovery of the country, great projects, a huge investment, but they haven't heard us yet. How do we get through to the current projects recovering the cities, but they do not take into account this universal desire with the barrier-free environments. They are creating the kindergartens without the principles of inclusion. I am watching it all from another country and my heart is tearing apart. But uh, there are also huge NGOs that could do something and tell me more, what can we do to get through to the government so that they could hear us? Thank you, Victoria, for saying this out loud, because it's crucial to talk about this. And I also would like to emphasize on that. What I mentioned in the beginning, there are visible barriers and there are invisible barriers. Unfortunately, as the landscape project for barrier-free environment is great, but I agree with you that uh, the project doesn't represent uh, every disability. They do not have the comprehensible view on disability. And uh, we shall explain this in public. So it's very important. You are a potential beneficiary and it's important that you notice it and you speak out loud about this. This is not happening. I am seeing this from the professional standpoint and I understand that the rest of the society should be seeing that. We will be trying to really bring this forward and to mainstream this because it's visible. And thank you for mentioning this because these invisible barriers, they uh, like for kindergartens, for schools, uh, for social services. On the one hand, they are available, they exist, but they are not accessible for their beneficiaries, basically. It's a mini dialogue. It, it's very important to have it. So thank you for that, because this is something that is uh, pushing us forward. And this is the great government supported initiative. We cannot criticize them because the government is doing their best to make sure that Ukraine uh, survives and we win. But we can still be the engine. We and you, the parents of children with disabilities, you must be the experts who must be helping the government understanding things. And our role is to make sure the government can hear you, the government and the international donors, so that they could take into account the children with disabilities, the parents, the family members uh, with people with disabilities when they design these uh, great, uh, super great projects and programs. Uh, And now I'm trying to, instead of recommendations uh, that I cut my presentation off, this is a recommendation to include the voices of people with disabilities, like Makola, of parents uh, with children with disabilities, of children with disabilities. These are three very different large scale projects when we include their voices. This is when we comply with the convention, with this uh, uh, principle for us without us. This is extremely important. Thank you very much for raising that. And I think even when we speak about this uh, high profile project on the level of the first lady and the president of the country, we are not in the position to criticize them, but we, us and you, could be the experts for what is happening. Therefore, it's important to promote that voice. So on our side, we could do our best to make sure your voices are heard. 
because you cannot uh, implement the reform for the parents of children with disabilities to um, include the people uh, with disabilities without hearing the people with disabilities and knowing what is happening. Are there any other questions? We still have some 10 minutes. Any comments, any questions? Any reflections, threats? Inna? Hello, everyone. Hello, Helena. I just joined because I didn't have the connection before, but we talked earlier and we were saying that maybe my experience for adoption could be useful. I'm not sure what you managed to discuss. So I am the candidate for adoption and currently I am on a very complicated stage of searching for my child. I just want to comment here that Ina is trying to adopt a child in Ukraine during the martial law. Even though the orphanages are overfilled, she's getting the rejections. All right, then let me brief you about this. I will be short. So it took us quite fast in the Ukrainian context to get to the candidate for adoption. It only took six months. So every time I would just switch on my internal lawyer, I would try to pressure. So it took us six months to get into the register. And now we have the official right to uh, see around the children. Of course, in Kiev, in the relevant service, they told us that there were no children. We were number 37 on the waiting list. Uh, you should go to the region. So I called to all social services in all regions of Ukraine, everywhere. They told me uh, there were no children available and i need to say that i wouldn't be looking for you know a healthy perfect boy with blue eyes etc we are ready to adopt anyone and they are telling me there is no child available for adoption i'm also talking to other parents uh, on the waiting list uh, who have been there for one year for 18 months already and even those uh, who are on the waiting list, not only for adoption, but for foster families, none of them is getting the profiles of children to see almost all children in the orphanages. They have no statuses uh, open for adoption or for fostering. There are many reasons because they don't want to um, get their children adopted because many children already were evacuated abroad. So, you know, they will have to close down the orphanages or at least they will need to make them redundant uh, and fire all of the social workers. Uh, so I only um, started my struggle, but there are other parents, candidates for adoption uh, who haven't seen any profiles of their prospective children for adoption in a year or in 18 months. Uh, today, I participated in a conference and there was the Ombudsman for Children's Rights uh, and uh, the head of the Social Service of Ukraine, they know about these problems, but unfortunately, they do not have any impact on the social services on the grounds. They cannot uh, uh, check them because it's martial law and the inspections are not allowed uh, and they cannot have the ad hoc inspections because they need uh, the uh, solid justifications. Uh, so it's very difficult to get out of this vicious circle. So we know about the huge number of children. Official data is about 17,000 of children staying in the orphanages and most of them have no chance to get into the family, either temporary or forever for adoption. I'm not going to talk about the corruption schemes that keep popping up uh, and the fact that I was talking to the orphanage staff, they are not giving to me the information about the profile of children because it's criminal liability, but they are saying that they have children. And uh, like, I mean, um, fit for adoption that the parents might be interested in. They are not even entered into the general register because there is this shadow register where they sell these children. 
and the social services are trying to see which parents are ready to pay and they are then demonstrating these children to the parents uh, from the very beginning uh we were trying to present ourselves that we will only do everything according to the law and the official register does not have any children available so i'm not here to complain but i need to say that i realize since i am a lawyer i will do my best uh my utmost to break this system and to build the new system. So I have two roads to take to find my own child, but I'm not going to stop on that because my child is one child out of 17,000 and other 16,999 children, they are not protected by anyone. There is no one to protect them. And they are victims to this corrupt, rotten system. That is why I am extremely grateful that the people who today take the high positions, uh, top positions, they showed their understanding to break this situation. They admitted, frankly, they didn't have any leverage, but they are ready to do their best. We agreed that we would meet informally, joining our efforts and sharing our ideas to destroy this system and uh, to make the orphanages the place where children could find their families in the perfect world, they will eventually be closed and we will shift to another system or foster families, whatever type uh, where children would immediately go to the foster family where they will get care, love uh, and social services should be interested to find the family for the child as soon as possible. Thank you, Ina. You raised so many important issues at the same time. It's not even about the bubble of NGOs anymore. It's a person who is going to adopt a child. Right to either a boy or girl, right. Any child, regardless of any uh, characteristics. And what we see Eventually, as soon as we start talking about the, the institutionalization reform, when we close down all institutions, etc., the child must be in the family. So the first barrier we face, who wants to adopt these children? This is number one. And then when it turns out that actually there are families who are ready to adopt these children because there are over there. And then it turns out that most of these children, they have no adoption status. That means that they have their parents, the parents who have not rejected those children, but they keep them in the institutions. Why? There are different reasons, but mostly because they do not have the community level support. Of course, there are families that reject their children or half reject their children. This, it's not important now. Now, what is important to say that most children in the institutions are without the adoption status, so you cannot adopt them or uh, take into the foster family. You cannot do anything about them, but keep them in institutions only. That is why this is a very important aspect to mention. So thank you, Ina, for raising this uh, question. We need more voices now, and I'm getting back to this uh, discussion that we need the social demand, the demand from the society, the request. Uh, uh, while we have this uh, top bottom approach, now we should have the bottom up approach that we want this in that way. We believe this is how it should be. Before that, this uh, seems not to be existent. Before it's named, it's not existent. Before anything is named, and non-existence, we still have very many children, they grow up, they become young adults like Makola, and they stay in the shadow, they stay in those institutions, and they fall out of the framework of any system that tells them, on the one hand, well, you have rights, on the other hand, they say you don't have the right because one, two, three, there are many reasons. I understand that we are running out of time for this meeting, but I also understand there are so many aspects and topics that are not known to the general public. 
they are not known because this is a stigmatized topic. Anastasia was very good to say that this topic is stigmatized even when you yourself, you seem like you are open to everything. Still, this stigma is part of you. It's, it's ingrained. We still have two questions, two more questions from Fiona from Edge Hill University. This is Professor Fiona Hallett whether it's possible for us to continue the series of these webinars to share the stories. I totally agree with Fiona that we at least need to talk about this, because before we talk about this, nobody knows about that. I believe Inna knows best about what is happening. Exactly. I'm taking all of the pain of the client from the beginning till the end. But most people do not know this, who decided not to get into that topic. Yes, I'm sorry to interrupt, but when I first said in public that they are not giving a child for us for adoption, most of us decided that we have, a, you know, high expectations because there are so many children available out there we are trying to you know pr on that topic because they keep showing on television there's so many children you should adopt them and people do not understand that there is a problem because uh, if we try to see how many people are engaged uh, with the adoption or take care of the children who live in the institutions there are a few of us we hear each other but the general public does not even imagine we exist. Well, I believe that's a good note to conclude. Let's have the semicolon here because actually in institutions, um, they are beneficial for somebody. So all of these topics that when you get the, the child uh, gets this, this topic on uh, either naturally or when you get a child to the family through the social support, it's not a priority. The institution is a priority for the government, unfortunately, and we can change it. And the same as Ina does it, we can do this bottom up, right, from the grounds. You can start from the basic level a very lawful level, a legitimate level, and it's the impossible uh, road. And we should to get up to the moment for getting the support from the international donors to support the child-centered systems uh, to get children into families instead of supporting institutions. Like Irena said, like the government is sitting on a split. On the one hand, that is true. On the other hand, we need to understand what the priority is. Child is a priority. The child must be in the family. It's the axiom. And on the basis of this, then taking different sides, international, national, and grassroots as well. I mean, from the basic moment, when we are like a person, a citizen of Ukraine, wants to adopt a child, this grassroots level, we should act on different levels and change the system. This system does not have a single entry point for change. We must consider this system from different perspectives and attack it at the same time from different sides, if I may, and use this comparison. It's the end of the webinar, like from the Defense Intelligence of Ukraine, they were saying the counteroffensive is going to be quiet. Same here. We should attack from different sides. Otherwise, it would be impossible to tackle. It's a complicated topic. It's multi-layered topic, it's potentially corrupt, and our task is always to remember who is in the center. It's a child, the interest of the child, that's it. 
Thank you, Helena. Thank you, everyone. We shall continue this effort on and on, continue talking about this. There are no other questions. Victoria and Ina, you still have your hands raised, but it's from the previous. I still need to say something. It's the end, but I must say something. Am I allowed to add at least one sentence? Go ahead. First of all, I need to say that there is a huge need for good advocacy support because in many cases, parents do not know their rights. And the lack of social services on the grounds, on the community level, when you come and ask them and they tell you, you can't do this and you cannot and you're not able to properly and legitimately explain that. So if we had this advocacy support, that would be great to promote this issue in the legally uh, proper form. Thank you. Thank you, Olena. And all of the recommendations that we offered in our Disability Rights International report that we will share in English and then in Ukrainian, this is one of the recommendations to empower parents uh, in understanding their rights uh, and also to empower young people with disabilities in their capacity to protect their rights and to speak out loud about themselves. All of this is uh, included in our plans. I can see that there is the air raid alert in Kiev. Please stay safe. Um, we will be finishing soon. The report of Disability Rights International in English and a brief summary in Ukrainian will be shared for the participants and also on our website. Uh, and also I need to say that we as Disability Rights Ukraine we are running the meetings of parents twice a month for different uh, on different topics. You can uh, track them in our social media, Facebook and Instagram. We will share on the chat the link to our accounts on Instagram and Facebook. And of course, you can always contact us uh, directly.